So in this algebraic geometry lecture, we will move on from affine varieties to projective varieties, and we'll start by um, describing projective space. So the definition of projective space over a field K is you can define it as the set of one dimensional subspaces of an N plus one dimensional space over K. Um, in other words, each line in N plus one dimensional vector space corresponds to a point of projective space. So we can use coordinates as follows. So a point of projective space can be denoted by a point um, of um, N plus one dimensional affine space. So it corresponds to the line going through this point. However, um, um, if this point is zero, it doesn't really define a line. So we have to say not all x, i are equal to zero. And furthermore, if we multiply this by scalar, it defines the same line. So this point is actually considered to be the same as the point lambda x naught, lambda x one, and so on, lambda x n for lambda in k, lambda not zero. Um, so we put colons between the coordinates to indicate that we're allowed to multiply by a scalar without really changing what the point is. So let's take a look at what affine, what projective space looks like. Well, first of all, if x naught is non-zero, we can rescale x naught and find that the point x naught up to x n, sorry, is the same as the point one y naught y one up to y n where yi is equal to xi over x naught. And this gives us a copy of affine space a to the n. So n-dimensional projective space contains n-dimensional affine space. And what's left over? Well, if x naught is equal to naught, we're looking at the points naught, x1, x2, and so on, up to multiplication by scalars. And this gives us a copy of n minus one di um, dimensional projective space. So in other words, we can see that projective space over a field is a disjoint union of affine space and projective space of one dimension lower. So we think of these as being points at infinity. in some sense. So projective space can be thought of as taking affine space and adding some points at infinity and the points at infinity themselves form a, a projective space of lower dimension. Um, so let's just look at what it looks like over the reals and the complex numbers. So let's look at projective space over the real numbers. So we're looking at points x naught up to x n, not all zero. And we can rescale it um, so that x naught squared all the way up to plus x n squared is equal to one, just by multiplying by um, a suitable constant. Um, and if we do this, there are exactly two points um, corresponding to the same line, which are this point here and minus x naught up to minus xn. Um, well, these points here correspond to a sphere S, um, Sn, and these are opposite points of the sphere. So projective space of n dimensions over the reals looks like Sn, except we identify opposite points. Um, so naught dimensional projective space over R is just a point. It's not very interesting. One dimensional projective space over R 
looks like, well, you take a circle and you identify opposite points. And if you think about this a bit, you'll see that's just the same as a circle, except it's wrapped around itself twice. So one dimensional projective space over the reals is just a circle. Two dimensional projective space over the reals is S2, where we identify opposite points. And um, this is the simplest example of a non-orientable surface. Um, so um, in general, um, and obviously in general, we do the same thing. We just take a sphere and identify opposite points. Um, what happens over the complex numbers? Well, um, in this case, we can take a point x0, x1, up to xn of n-dimensional complex space. And this time we can, we, we can rescale so that, so that the squares of the absolute values are equal to 1. Um, so the points with this property form a copy of the um, sphere of dimension 2n plus 1, because if we put xi equals yi plus ci, this is just the same as saying the sum of the yi squared plus the sum of the zi squared is equal to 1, so we're again getting a sphere. However, we have to do more than identify opposite points because this point is equivalent to um, lambda x naught up to lambda xn whenever lambda has absolute value equal to 1. And the complex numbers of absolute value 1 just form a copy of the circle. So what we end up with is a map from s to n plus 1 onto n-dimensional complex space. And the fibers are, um, are just copies of S1. So this is an example of something called a fibration in algebraic topology, which we won't worry about what the definition of this is too much because we're not actually doing algebraic topology. You can think of a fibration as being something like a, a product, except it's kind of twisted a bit, so it's not quite a product. Um, <clears throat> so if we take n equals 1. So one-dimensional projective space over C is just a copy of one-dimensional affine space plus a point, which is just the Riemann sphere, which topologically is isomorphic to an ordinary sphere S2. So what we find is we're getting a fibration S3 mapping on to S2, and the fibers are just copies of S1, which we denote like this. So, so this means we've got a base space S2, S3 maps onto it, and all the fibers are S1. Um, so this is the famous hop fibration. And algebraic topologists get very excited about things like this, because if you've got a fibration, you can relate the homotopy groups of the various spaces. So you can do things like show the third homotopy group of S2 is non-trivial and, and so on. Um, so another example of a fibration would be S1 goes to S1 times S2 goes to S2. So this would be the projection onto S2 and um, S3 and S1 cross S2 are certainly not the same as each other. So in some sense, S3 so S3 is not a product of S2, but it's some sort of twisted product in some sense. Um, and of course, we can stick in higher projective spaces here and get more fibrations, but um, we're not going to worry about that anymore. Um, um, also, you can cover projective space with copies 
what should we cover? Of affine space A n. And if we look at P n C, so P n of K, its coordinates are given like this. And if we take x naught not equal zero, this gives us a copy of affine space. Similarly, we can take x naught not zero, and this gives us another copy of affine space. And we can go all the way up to x n is not equal to zero, and we get another copy of affine space. So altogether, it's covered by n plus one copies of n-dimensional affine space. Um, and this is fairly typical for what happens with a projective variety. We will see that projective varieties can be obtained by gluing together copies of affine varieties. So we should think of projective space as being got by taking n plus one copies of affine space and somehow gluing them all together. Um, so I now give some historical background about where projective space come from came from. Um, so projective geometry um, well, one of its origins was what happens if you draw a picture of something. So if you've got a, an artist here and he's got an easel where he's trying to draw a picture of something, and he's drawing a picture of um, some object like a, um, a triangle. And he tries to draw a picture of the triangle on his picture, which means you're, you're sort of projecting from the artist's eye from, the, from, from this triangle to the plane um, that the artist is drawing on. And you can ask what properties are preserved by projection. Um, so one property that isn't preserved is parallel lines. So for instance, uh, the well-known example of this is suppose the artist is drawing a picture of a railway track. So here we've got a, a railway track looking like this. And the lines of a railway track are parallel. However, if you draw a picture of it, um, they're not parallel on your picture because they kind of meet at infinity. Um, so the question is, what properties are preserved? Well, straight lines are preserved because if you project a straight line, then it still remains a straight line. And um, people studied this and came up with a sort of collection of axioms for projective geometry. So there are two approaches to geometry, synthetic geometry, is where you write down a set of axioms. So the classical example of this is Euclid's axioms for uh, Euclidean geometry, where you um, have Euclid's five axioms. Actually, Euclid missed out a lot of necessary axioms, but never mind. And you can also have analytic geometry. And analytic geometry, you just use coordinates and turn geometry into algebra. Um, and we've been discussing the analytic geometry approach to projective geometry, where you just write down coordinates for projective geometry and work with those. And that's what we'll be doing most of the time. But I'll just say a little bit about what the what synthetic geometry looks like for projective geometry. So the axioms for synthetic projective geometry. Look like this. First of all, um, 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 any two um, distinct points um, meet a unique line. I'm missing out some background saying there should be a set of points and a set of lines and an incidence relation um, because I'm not actually going to be using these axioms. The second one says that any two lines in the same plane 
meet in one point any two distinct lines there should be distinct lines and any two distinct points well what do i mean by same plane because i haven't defined what a plane is um well this is a um two lines meet in the same plane if when you take four points on them and join them up like this these two lines meet so meeting in the same plane can be defined using just points and lines and the third you need a third axiom which is non-degenerate says that any line meets at least three points and you need this third axiom because if you allow lines with two points then there are a lot of rather stupid configurations you can have where you take two copies of something satisfying these axioms and just have a line joining every point of the first object to every point of the second object so this is a sort of non-degeneracy condition um and we can ask um what um objects um can we get satisfying these at you find that anything satisfying these must just be a single point which is really boring in dimension one we get one line plus a lot of points, which is again completely boring. Um, in dimension two, um, the definition of dimension two is that any two lines meet. So you find you get the axioms saying that any two lines meet in a unique point and any two distinct points lie on a unique line. So this is something called a projective plane. And there are two sorts of projective planes called desarguing ones and non desarguing ones that we will describe in a moment. Anyway, here's an example of a projective plane. This is called the Fano plane. Um, and it has seven straight lines and seven points. And I've drawn the seven straight lines here. And you may think one of these straight lines looks awfully like a circle, but I'm decreeing that it's actually straight. So um, there are actually seven straight lines. So this is the Fano plane. Dimension greater than or equal to three. We can get lots of examples by just taking projective space over a field. Well, in fact, it turns out we don't need to take this over a field. We can even take it over a division ring. And it turns out these are all the examples of projective space there are. In dimension at least three, the only examples of projective space you get are given by um, doing the construction I did earlier over any division ring. Um, the difference between one projective space over a field or a division ring is that being over a commutative field is equivalent to Pappus's theorem holding where well, you remember Pappus's theorem was the theorem I mentioned in one of the earlier lectures so in other words you don't really gain very much generality by using synthetic geometry um, any projective space of dimension at least three you can study using projective geometry you can study equally well using analytic geometry and coordinates and that turns out in practice to be an awful lot easier than trying to use axioms so synthetic geometry using axioms has mostly died out as a, a research area and people only study projective space using using coordinates well, I mentioned that there are actually two sorts of projective planes, desarguing ones and non-desarguing ones. Um, and uh, these are planes that satisfy um, something called Desargues theorem. Um, so um, the next lecture, I'll be discussing Desargues' theorem.